So typically we do a, a do now to review the previous chapter, which in our case would be chapter three, where we talked about states of matter, we talked about physical changes, um, metals, metalloids, non-metals, those kinds of things. But because chapter four wasn't posted until later, I had some technical issues with recording chapter four. Um, I thought it would be best to use our time by going through some of the major points of chapter four and giving you an idea of the types of questions you're going to see on the exam and on your homework. So everything has been posted. I was working through the night, literally, to make sure that everything was posted before our class today. So when you go onto Blackboard, you will see a um, chapter four folder with all of the normal things, you know, the link for the regular recorded lecture, the annotated notes. You will also see um, a link for a YouTube video that will help explain um, some of the concepts a little bit better that I found for you guys, along with the periodic table and your chapter four check-in. So all of that is posted. If you don't see it, let me know. But you should be able to see that on Blackboard currently. I see a hand raised. Do you have a question? Okay, perhaps not. Alrighty. So if you do have a question, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to lower this hand. And we're going to get started with chapter four. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson. And what I recommend you do either now while I'm going through it or when you're watching the video on YouTube is that you make a timeline that will help kind of place things um, where they need to be and help you get a better idea of how the model of the atom that we currently use came to be. So we're going to start all the way back in ancient Greece. And we're going to talk about atomic theory way, way back. So there's a philosopher, Aristotle, which you may have heard of, um, kind of a popular guy. He had all kinds of thoughts on all types of topics. And what he argued is that matter is continuous. What that really means is that you can take matter, so think about anything that's matter, and you can keep breaking apart infinitely. There's no limit to how many times you can break apart a piece of matter. It will still be that matter. Democritus, however, argued that matter is discontinuous. That at some point, you can't divide matter anymore. It's not going to be matter. It's going to be something else. And he called that point atomos. So you will need to know the difference between these two arguments what continuous versus discontinuous means with matter. Is everybody with me so far? You can give me a yeah, a thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Now, I'm sure people have thought about, you know, atomic theory in between ancient Greece and 1803, okay? But we're going to skip ahead quite a bit. There's a man named John Dalton who made a lot of observations about nature. And using those observations, one of the things he did was publish the first atomic theory, His theory has five postulates, which pretty much means that it has five points. And you're going to need to know these points to be able to answer questions about them. So we'll go through them and make sure that you understand it. So the first point that he made, which is part of an observation, he said, well, an element 
is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. We know t atoms are very small, okay? He didn't quite get it right with indivisible because we can divide an atom. It just isn't an atom anymore. It's subatomic particles. And we'll talk about those. The second part is that all atoms of any given element are identical and they have the same properties. So if you have an atom of aluminum here in the US, you go overseas to the UK and you have an atom of aluminum, it will be exactly the same. The third is that you can take those different atoms and combine them to form compounds. Remember that a compound is a combination of elements and it's also classified as a pure substance. So that's a reach back to chapter three. You with me so far? Atoms are small, indestructible, all atoms of an element are identical and you can combine them to form different compounds. So we haven't said anything that should be foreign to you. This is kind of like, yeah, okay. What else? Is water wet? Like, but remember, this is 1803, okay? A lot of things weren't understood yet. If there were a pandemic like this in 1803, everybody be dead, okay? 1803 was a very, very different time. So this atomic theory was actually really groundbreaking. The fourth point that he made is that compounds have atoms in small whole number ratios. So you're not gonna have half an atom of oxygen. You're not gonna have three quarters of an atom of hydrogen. It's always gonna be a whole number. You can't have part of an atom. And finally, you can have different ratios of the same atoms to form different compounds. So one example would be H2O is water. We drink it, we love it. But if you change that to H2O2, you better not drink that. That's hydrogen peroxide. So you put that on a cut or something to clean it up. It's also a part of OxyClean if you use that when you're doing your laundry. Again, you don't want to drink that. So it's the same two atoms, just different ratios, and that makes different compounds. You can also do chemistry to form different compounds and different ratios. So this is Dalton's atomic theory. You'll need to be able to talk about which parts of his theory were not quite correct. So one part would be the indivisible part. That's just an example. And as we go through chapter four, between the live lecture and the lecture that's posted on YouTube, you'll be able to pick that apart. So are we good on Dalton's atomic theory? You don't have to fully understand all of it, although it is, uh, you know, kind of simple and a bit no duh, um, based on kind of our, where we are with chemistry today. But those are the five points that he had. So we have some more time pass. And in 1897, a man named J.J. Thompson determined the charge to mass ratio of cathode rays. Now y'all may not know about cathode rays, but if you're old enough, or maybe your parents or somebody told you about their own TVs, TVs used to have cathode rays in them. And they were stupid heavy, like real heavy. These little flat screens now, or the flat screen monitors that you have for a desktop? No, ma'am, no, sir. Those cathode rays made them joints real heavy. You had to be super strong to be lifting up them TVs. So if you have a 50 inch TV and it's CRT, mm -mm. nope, you need help. Now you can lift that bad boy up with one finger. Not the case back in the day. So JJ Thompson is one of the people who we can credit for helping out with the entertainment industry because we have TV as part of, you know, what he discovered. Anyway, he discovered this charge to mass ratio and he was given credit for the discovery of the electron. Super proliferous dude. 
he had his own lab. He trained a lot of um, graduate students who also went on to do things to contribute to this field. He also proposed the plum pudding model of the atom in 1903. And what he said was that you've got this sea of positive charge. And within that, you've got little dots of electrons. So the electrons are like the plums, which are also, we call them raisins, okay? And the pudding part is the sea of electrons, or excuse me, the sea of positive charge. The other part that he proposed is that atoms are mostly empty space. So that's the plum pudding model. You'll need to know what represents the plums, what represents the pudding, and just the general idea of what the plum pudding model is. So are we good on Thompson so far? And I know this is a little different from how we usually do things. We're gonna get to doing some problems, I promise. But I wanted to walk through the history a little bit just to give you some context about where we are. So we're kind of going to jump ahead and then go back in time. So a few years down the road, a man named Robert Milliken determined the charge of an electron. And that enabled J.J. Thompson to calculate the mass of the electron and the mass of the proton. So that was work that was built, you know, on what Thompson had started. But then let's step back just a few years because I mentioned the proton. And that certainly wasn't part of J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model. So some stuff must have happened in between the plum pudding model being proposed and the mass of the electron being calculated by J.J. Thompson. Ernest Rutherford was a student of J.J. Thompson, and he eventually had his own lab. So he and one of his graduate students created this experiment to test whether or not the plum pudding model accurately describes what an atom is. What they did was said, okay, if the plum pudding model is correct, then we should be able to shoot large particles, which these alpha particles are large, positively charged particles. We should be able to shoot those right through an atom and the particle shouldn't deflect at all. So this picture here is a depiction of that. You have your alpha particles, you shoot them at some kind of matter, and they should just go straight through like there's nothing there. This is kind of what the setup looked like. So you have to have some kind of a source of alpha particles. And you shoot this beam at a thin gold foil. If the plum pudding model was correct, all of the particles would just go straight through. And most of them did. But some were scattered or deflected in different directions. And that suggests that the alpha particles must have run into something. And that something must have been massive enough or charged enough to deflect this big old alpha particle. What do you think the alpha particles encountered? If you think about what you know about an atom, what do you think the alpha particles hit when they were deflected? Think about it and put it in the chat.
Exactly. Hit the nucleus. So, this experiment was a huge game changer. And it sounds like, okay, well, yeah, duh, it's just the nucleus. But again, remember, what they were working on was the plum pudding model. Somebody was hungry and said, yeah, the electrons are like raisins. And this experiment showed no. There's something at the center of an atom, and they called it the atomic nucleus, that contains the protons, the, all that positive charge. It's not just a C, it's concentrated. So the Rutherford model of the atom places a nucleus at the center, and then you have your electrons in the empty space around the atom. Now they did some calculations to figure out the approximate diameter of the atom and the nucleus. And we're talking tiny, 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 y'all. 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, 10 to the minus eight centimeters. That ain't big, okay? That's real, real small. So you cannot see an atom, even if you try your hardest, if you wish upon a star, you cannot see it. Based on how big the nucleus was, they predicted that there must be some other particle in addition to protons in the nucleus. So Rutherford proposed that there are these neutral particles, a part of the nucleus, and those neutrons, which they're now called, were discovered by James Chadwick. So you don't need to know all of the, the dates, but you do need to know some of the names. So the names that you definitely need to know are Dalton, and just no last names, Thompson, Rutherford. You don't really need to know James Chadwick, although he did important work. But those three names, you definitely want to know who they are and what they did. Now, we never give the grad students credit, not as much, but that's the name of the graduate student, Hans Geiger. Okay. You don't have to know him, but just know he existed. He helped. So this table summarizes the subatomic particles. We already know the electron, the proton, and the neutron. You probably already knew that before this class. That's just kind of something you encounter in science classes throughout your years of schooling before you get to college. These symbols here are what we're going to use to represent electrons, protons, and neutrons. So when you see them, make that association. There's also the location of each of these particles. Electrons are outside of the nucleus. Everything else is inside. We've got the re relative charge, which the electrons, negative one, protons, positive one, and the neutrons are neutral, they're zero. You don't have to know the exact relative mass. Just know that the electron is the smallest particle. And the proton and the neutron are approximately equal in mass. And that will be enough to get you through. So are we good? That's kind of the history lesson bringing you up to where we are today with the structure of the atom in terms of subatomic particles and how we got here. So let me know. We good so far? So now we're going to get into some of the concepts and we're going to do some problems. Okay. So the first concept is we have to learn how to write the different nomenclature. So each element has its own number of protons, and that's called the atomic number. To write that a different way, atomic number, you will see it as Z. You could also, my shorthand is number of 
protons, okay? Each element has a different number of protons, and that is what contributes to the different characteristics that you see in each element. Each element and each atom of an element also has a mass number. And that mass number is the sum of the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. If we were to use our notation, we've got P plus plus N zero is equal to A, which is our mass number. When you look at atomic notation, you're going to see the symbol of the element, and then you're gonna see a superscript, that's the mass number, and the atomic number as a subscript. So for example, carbon, its symbol is this letter C. It has six protons. That's the atomic number, so it goes down as the subscript. There are six protons and six neutrons in carbon-12, so 12 is the mass number. So that's what it would look like if we were to write carbon-12 in atomic notation. So right now, if you don't have a periodic table, you need to grab one. So there's one on Blackboard already. You can also Google it if you have the book because you're gonna need it for the rest of the time today. And pretty much going forward, you will always need a periodic table. So make sure that you have one ready. So, so far we've covered atomic number, that's the number of protons. The mass number, it's protons plus neutrons. Finally, we need to talk about electrons. In a neutral atom, which means the net charge of the atom is zero, you have the same number of protons as you do electrons. Remember, protons are positively charged Electrons are negatively charged. If, that n if the numbers are not equal, then you have a charge. You're no longer neutral. So when you're trying to figure out how many protons something has, how many electrons something has, remember for a neutral atom, those two numbers should be the same. Are we good so far? We've got atomic number, mass number, atomic notation, and then protons equals neutrons, or protons equals electrons, excuse me, in a neutral atom. Those are the main points on this slide. Now the reason why we care about the number of neutrons is because each element, it's not exactly, exactly the same. They differ in the number of neutrons in the nucleus. So some elements may have one isot or two isotopes or three isotopes. And those isotopes, like I said, have a different number of neutrons. So they have the same atomic number, but different mass numbers. So how this might be represented is there is carbon-12. That's the element name. and then the mass number. There's also carbon-13. That's another isotope. This isotope has one extra neutron. So its atomic mass is slightly different than carbon-12 but it still has pretty much the same properties as carbon-12. So you'll notice how I wrote this, and I think I have a slide on this, but the way that you represent an isotope is the element name, either written out in full or the symbol, 
then you put a dash and you put the mass number. So when you're trying to represent an isotope, this is another way that you can do it. So do we get the concept of isotopes? Same element, which means the same atomic number, same number of protons, but you may have a few extra neutrons along for the ride. That's all an isotope is. So are we good on that concept? Good. So we're getting to the part where you're going to be able to do some problems, I promise. But chapter four was posted so late. And I know y'all weren't worried about chapter four. Y'all worried about the exam. And then when Respondus was acting up, he said, well, shoot, I need to do this chapter three stuff. So y'all weren't worried about chapter four. I know this. But I was. So let's do a little bit of practice. I have a chart here. And it's missing some information. So make sure that you get out a periodic table if you have not yet, because you will need it. What I want you to do is fill in the missing information. So in some cases, you will have to figure out which element is represented. You may have to figure out the mass number, number of electrons, protons, what have you. So before I let you loose, let me ask you this. What piece of information from the chart can you use to identify which element is present? There are two things that you can use. We're just looking at this top part of the table. So you can definitely use the atomic number, okay? The atomic number will help you identify what element you're looking at. So if you looked up whichever element had the nine, so remember on the periodic table, you've got the atomic number up top and then your symbol underneath that. So you're looking at this number of top for the atomic number. The other thing that can help you, if you don't have the atomic number, is the number of protons because they're the same thing. So use that to figure out what element you have. Then you can go in and fill in the other things. So I'm gonna give you five minutes to go for it on your own and fill in this chart. If you can fill in this chart, then you understand all of the concepts that we've talked about up to right now. So five minutes, fill it in, and then we'll go over it. If you need a periodic table, you can just go on a blackboard and look in the chapter four folder. There is a periodic table posted already. That's the one that you're gonna get for your exams. So I would recommend that you get comfortable with that one. All right, I'm gonna let you loose five minutes. Do we need more time or are we ready? <laughs> this is going to be a little bit difficult. Okay, I can give you a couple more minutes. Take a couple more minutes. We won't really be able to write this into the chat. The most we'll be able to do is maybe you can tell me what element, or I can ask you for the mass number or something like that. But the atomic notation, we're not even gonna try. So another two minutes, and then I'll check back in. Let's get started with filling this in. For the first row, what element is it? You can just give me the, the symbol. What element 
is this row describing? Yeah, it's fluorine. What did you get for the mass number? Yep, it should be 19. And the way you get that is you take the number of neutrons, you add the number of protons, which we know from the atomic number, and that gives you 19. So for our atomic notation, we'll add 19 to the top. That's where the mass number goes. Now the cat's out of the bag for the number of protons. It's 9. We were already given the number of neutrons. How many electrons do we have? The number of electrons is going to be equal to the number of protons because we're talking about a neutral atom. So if you know the number of protons, then you automatically know the number of electrons in a neutral atom. In this case, we've got nine protons, so we have to have nine electrons in order to have a neutral atom. Let's go down to the second row. What element is this row describing? It's phosphorus, P. What is the atomic number for phosphorus? Right. So if you didn't get that, that's the number of protons, which is already filled in. For our atomic notation, oops, that goes down at the bottom. We were already given the mass number, and that goes up at the top. So when you're doing your homework, you may have to do it by hand or you can use text boxes because you can't do a superscript and a subscript right underneath each other. So as long as I know which is which when you're doing your homework, it's all good. What do we get for the number of neutrons in a phosphorus atom? Yeah, you should have taken, oops, not 30. Hand has a mind of its own, y'all. The mass number, which is 31, and subtract the number of protons. That's going to give you 16. How many electrons do we have? We've got 15 electrons because we've got 15 protons and we know that the overall charge of our atom has to be zero. What about the last row? What element are we looking at here? We are looking at nickel. We're already told it's atomic number, that's 28. What did we get for the mass number? Yeah, you should get 59. So the atomic number tells you the number of protons, and that's 28. And the number of neutrons is 31. When you add those two together, 
you should get 59. And that will tell you the mass number. What about the number of electrons? It should be the same number as the protons. So it should be 28. If you were able to do this, then that means you understand atomic notation, the relationships between atomic number, mass number, the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in a neutral atom. So if you have trouble with this, then you need to go back and revisit those relationships. And again, this is a chapter four overview. It's not every single nuanced detail. So you will still need to go to YouTube and watch the full chapter four lecture. But if all you do is this, you will get a good amount of chapter four. So let me know if we're good to move on. It seemed like everybody that was participating was getting it right. So that makes me happy. then let's move on. We talked about part of what you might see on the periodic table, where you have a symbol and it's atomic, atomic number. So we did fluorine, right? And we figured out that that was what an atomic number of nine corresponds to. But then there's usually a number underneath. Your periodic table will probably have something like that, 19.00. That number is the atomic mass. The atomic mass is a weighted average of all the known isotopes of an element. So just like I said, okay, we have carbon 12, we have carbon 13. All of the carbon in the world is one of those two isotopes. And the weighted average of the mass of those two elements and their percent abundance, that's going to take, that's going to give us the atomic mass that you see underneath the chemical symbol. So you might be wondering, what is a weighted average? Well, let's think about your grade. 40% of your grade is mastering chemistry and the chapter check-ins. Another 40% of your grade is those exams. We also have a final exam. And since we're supposed to add up to 100%, if I didn't fill this in, you could say, well, 100% minus 40 minus another 40 is going to give me 20%. It should always add up to 100%. That is a weighted average. All things are not counted equally. So just by the nature of being in school, you've encountered a weighted average already. So what I'm gonna do is walk through a calculation of a weighted average with atomic mass to show you how it works. This is the same problem that I go through in the video. So if you don't get it now, you can watch it again either on the live session video or just the chapter four lecture. Gallium is an element that has two isotopes, gallium 69, and there's its mass. We represent the mass of an atom in atomic mass units. That's what AMU stands for. So when you're giving me an answer to this type of problem, you should have AMU as your units. Remember, I take off points if you don't have units. More like a half a point to a point, but you get the drift. You don't want to lose points because you didn't put the right units. So we've got a mass and a percent abundance for gallium 69. And we have similar information for gallium 71. 
And what we're asked to do is find the average atomic mass of gallium. Not a very difficult problem. Seems like a lot of numbers, but I promise you, if you use this method, you'll get it right every time. The first thing that you always have to do when you're solving a problem is organize your information. When we were doing chapter two stuff, oftentimes that meant rewriting the question because sometimes the question kind of got lost. In this case, we've got a lot of numbers. We need to organize those numbers so that we know what we have and what we're trying to calculate. For that, I recommend making a table. You're not always going to just have two isotopes. You could have multiple. Iron, I think, has like four or five naturally occurring isotopes. So I could give you a problem that has four or five isotopes in it. We're not going to start there, but it could go there. So the table is going to be really helpful. First thing you want to do is put down the two isotopes that you have. We have gallium 69 and gallium 71. Then we want to put down our percent abundance. You may not always get every single one of these values. One of them can be left out because when you add them together, you should get 100%. So if I gave you three values, because there were three isotopes, I could leave one of the percentages out and have you figure that out before you figure out the average atomic mass. But in this case, I'm being very, very gentle and very kind. Oops. And I'm also writing the wrong number into the box. This is why I recommend doing the table. It's very easy to write the wrong thing. They both start with six. It is early. I can't drink coffee. So give me some grace. So our percent abundance is 60.11% for gallium 69. Then there's going to be another column that I'm going to leave empty for now. I'm going to label that later. The third column that I want to put down is my atomic mass. And remember, that's an AMU. For gallium 69, it's 68.926. And gallium 71, 70.925. So this is all of the information that we have oh, and the percent abundance. That's all the information that we have. If you add up those two percentages, you get 100%. Make sure you do. Now this middle column, I like to express my percent abundance as a decimal. So to do that, 60.11%, that's like saying 0.6011. Does everyone follow me there? To be able to write a percentage, take a percentage and write it as a decimal. Just to test that, take this second abundance, 39.89%, and tell me what that is expressed as a decimal. So make sure that you understand that 0.9.3989. You're just moving the decimal place two places to the left. That's the equivalent of dividing by 100. Now we have our table all filled in. And what we have to do 
is figure out the atomic mass. What you're going to do is take your decimal and multiply it by your atomic mass. And you're going to do that for both cases. So I'll rewrite it so that you see what I mean. I'm going to take 0 0.6011 and multiply that by your atomic mass. Whatever product you get from that, you're going to add it to the product of the second isotope which is that percent abundance that we express as a decimal and multiply it by the atomic mass. So this is the contribution from the gallium 69 ion or excuse me isotope. And that's the contribution from gallium 71. Try putting that into your calculator and tell me what you get. Let's let a couple other people answer too. And I like the fact that you're using sig figs properly. So we've got four sig figs with our percentage and five sig figs with our atomic mass. So that means we're using four. And if you put it in your calculator, right, you should get 69.72 atomic mass units. So don't forget to put that AMU. If you don't put it on your chapter check-in, you're going to lose a half a point. You don't want to do that. So how do we feel about doing the atomic mass calculation? You will have one of these on your chapter check-in. Good. And on the chapter check-in, there are three isotopes, and I don't give you all of the percentages for the abundance. So remember, your percentages should add up to 100%. So you have to figure that out first before you can actually calculate the atomic mass. This is a good point for a break. After this, we're going to move into talking about electron configurations and energy levels and things like that. So it's kind of a, not a major shift, but I'm, I think you should shake your brain out for maybe five minutes or so because electron configurations can sometimes be a little bit difficult, but they're not difficult. You just got to take it slow. So we will take five minutes. I have this about to be 858. So, you know, we'll take, let's be generous. We'll take about seven minutes, okay? We'll come back at 905. So take a break till 905, shake out your brain. And if you have not gotten that periodic table, get one now, pull it up, okay? Because you will absolutely need it for this next section. See you in seven minutes. All right, y'all, break time is over. It is 9.07. So come on back and let's finish this bad boy up. It was a little bit late coming back, not bad. I needed a cough drop. 
my allergies were like, hey, girl, we coming for you. So those extra two minutes were filled with menthol and eucalyptus. So just to do a recap, this is what we've done so far. We did a brief history lesson of some of the things that we've gone through to get to understanding the structure of the atom and the model of the atom. We haven't yet fully arrived at the current model of the atom that we're using today. Then we talked about the periodic table, the symbols, atomic number, mass number, and the relationships between those two things, and the relationship between the number of protons and, el and electrons, excuse me, in a neutral atom. We did some practice with isotopes, writing atomic notation, and we talked about atomic mass. So we've covered quite a bit in about an hour. So let's do one more practice that's related to isotopes, just to make sure we're retaining things, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Given the only naturally occurring isotope of fluorine is F19, determine its mass from the periodic table. I'll give you two minutes to think about it. You should not need to reach for a calculator to do this problem. This is a concept check problem. If you understand the concept of isotopes and atomic mass, then you should be able to get this question. So I will give you two minutes to think about it. So we've got the only naturally occurring isotope of fluorine is F19. We're supposed to determine its mass from the periodic table. That mass should be 19 AMU. The reason for that is there's only one isotope. Remember that we did the weighted averages that includes all the various isotopes to figure out what the average atomic mass is. If there's only one isotope, there's no need to do an average. So whatever the mass is on the periodic table, if there's only one isotope, that is the mass for that isotope. Does that concept make sense? So I usually give a question like this on the exam. So I want you to understand it. I'm not trying to trick you. It is that easy of a question. That's usually what it is. Is it really just this? Yeah, that's it. Questions don't have to be hard if you understand what it's asking. So we're going to move on. Now we're going to shift gears to talking about more about electrons in particular. Before we can get to that, we have to talk about light. Light can be represented as a wave, and I'm sure you've heard that before. And there's all different wavelengths of light. We call all of those wavelengths the radiant energy spectrum. It's a continuous spectrum, so you can go all the way from really high wavelengths to really low wavelengths. The way that I will abbreviate wavelength is using a lambda. So when you see that, that means a wavelength. Now I give you more information about what a wavelength is. And we talk about frequency and energy in the chapter four lecture on YouTube. So I'm not going to go through those things specifically but you will need to understand 
the relationship between a long wavelength having, you know, is it a higher frequency or a lower frequency? Is it a higher energy or a low energy? We'll sort of address those things right now, but it's spelled out much more clearly in the chapter four lecture that's posted on YouTube. So please watch it and take notes from there. Everybody listens to the radio, you watch TV. Those are examples of light waves. So radio is all the way down here. If you're listening to 102 Jams on the way to work, that's radio waves. And they are long. Okay, they have a long wavelength and they have low energy. They also have a low frequency. So frequency and energy, they're not interchangeable, but if you have low energy, you also have a low frequency. As you move from right to left on this chart, you're going to start increasing your wavelength. So if we move up to TV, TV has higher energy than radio waves, has a shorter wavelength, but it's still in the category of long wavelength and low energy. Microwaves, if you use a microwave to heat up your cup noodles or whatever food you got from the dining hall that is now cold because you got it back to your room, you're using microwaves to heat up your food. Those are also in the kind of long wavelength category. Now you're gonna to need to know these different types and not necessarily the exact wavelengths associated with them, but the relative order. Next comes infrared. So if you have like night vision goggles, you're using infrared. Then there's the visible spectrum which we are very intimately familiar with. This is the light that we can detect with our human eyes. And you'll see that the visible spectrum is broken up into all the colors. You might recognize it as the colors of the rainbow and you'd be correct. So going in the order of longest wavelength to shortest wavelength, the colors of the rainbow are Roy G. Biv. That's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, which is like a dark blue, and violet. You will need to know that order. So make sure you know your rainbow. Roy G. Biv. That's how you can remember all of the, the colors and what order. After violet, you have ultraviolet light. Then x-rays. So if you've ever broken a bone, hope you haven't. Maybe you know someone who did. Or if you've been to the dentist, once a year, you should be getting x-rays along with your, um, your cleaning. X-rays, they tell you to, you know, you have to put on the, the lead um, covering over your chest because you don't want to expose yourself to x-rays anywhere that you don't have to. So we're getting to the, the higher energy and shorter wavelengths. Then we have gamma rays and cosmic rays. So these are short wavelengths, high energy, high frequency. So you will need to know those relative terms um, and be able to make comparisons. So let's do a quick check. Considering blue light and yellow light, which one of them has a longer wavelength? And I put this, uh, the chart down here. On the test, you're not going to get this chart. But since I'm just introducing it now, I'll let you use it because I'm nice. So which one has 
a longer wavelength, blue light or yellow light. You can just put B or Y. Yeah, it's gonna be yellow. So yellow is right around here. Blue, we're talking right around here. And these numbers, 600 nanometers, 500 nanometers, that's the actual wavelength. So you can tell just by the numbers, but you should also know, again, your rainbow. To go from the longer ones, longer wavelengths, to the shorter wavelengths. Still considering blue light and yellow light, which one has a higher energy, blue or yellow? The blue light is gonna have a higher energy. Which one has a higher frequency, blue or yellow? Blue again, so high frequency and high energy are always paired when we're talking about um, wavelengths. Now let's consider infrared light and x-rays. We're gonna do the same type of thing. So you can put I or X. Which one has a longer wavelength, infrared or x-rays? Infrared. Infrared has longer wavelengths. Which one has a higher energy and ultimately a higher frequency? It's gonna be x-rays for both of them because frequency and energy, they're paired. High frequency, you have high energy. So those are the types of comparisons you're gonna to need to make. You don't need to know the exact wavelengths. So you don't need to know that violet light is, you know, 400 nanometers. But you do need to know that violet light has more energy and a higher frequency than green light. So are we clear on what you need to know for the exam? All right. So we talked about our history lesson in the very beginning, and we left off at the Rutherford model of the atom, where you have the nucleus in the center, and in a sphere around that, you've got all your electrons, which are negatively charged. The nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. It's positively charged. Niels Bohr continued to add on to this model of the atom. And what he said is that electrons orbit around the nucleus in fixed energy levels. And those electrons can only be found in specific energy levels. Another word that we use to describe specific energy levels is quantized energy levels. And I talk about that in more detail in the chapter four lecture. I also talk about the evidence that was collected to suggest what the energy levels are and that they are quantized. I'm not gonna go over that here. You need to go over that with the chapter four lecture. We've only got but so much time. But just trust me, go on faith that these energy levels are quantized, which means that they're discrete. There's no rainbow, there's no smearing, okay? It's energy level one, energy level two. There is no 
You're only in one or two, nothing in between. Within these energy levels, we have different orbitals. So let's draw a little bit of a chart. We have a main energy level. And within that, we have orbitals. The types of orbitals are S, P, D, and F. Each of those orbitals has a certain number of orbitals associated with them. Certain number of sublevels, if you will. So if we were to go through and do an example, we'll use energy level four because it has all of these. So N is the same thing as the energy level, the principal energy level. Y'all, my brain. I'm so glad I can erase so easily. So in the N equals four main energy level, you have a 4S, 4P, 4D, and 4F. You have one 4S sublevel, three 4P sublevels, uh-oh, five 4D sublevels, and seven 4F sublevels. Now I'm going to go into what each energy level has because on the periodic table, you'll notice that there are seven rows. Each row corresponds to an energy level and those energy levels have particular orbitals associated with them and a certain number of orbitals. When we're moving across the periodic table, we are filling our electrons in one at a time. So we're increasing our atomic mass, which is the number of protons. And we're also increasing the number of electrons one by one in our neutral atom. So what the heck does that mean? This is just another depiction of the energy levels. So if we have our nucleus in the center, then the first thing that we're going to have is the 1s, and that is principal energy level 1. The only thing that we have in there is the 1s. Then we have the 2s, so principal energy level 2, and it's an s orbital. Still in the principal level of 2, we also have the 2p orbital. Does that make sense so far? Each energy level has different sublevels within it. That's really all we're saying here. And I'm telling you which sublevels are in each energy level. So if your brain hurts, let me know. I need some feedback now because this is where this is where I can lose you. If you're like, mm, try again, then tell me that. Help. I'm good. A little fuzzy.
Okay, I was waiting for the one more time as I knew it was there. I felt it in my spirit. This is really abstract. So it's something that you're going to have to sit with for a little bit. We have main energy levels, okay? So if you look at the rows of the periodic table, there are seven rows. You have N equals one, N equals two, N equals three. Goes all the way up to seven. I'm not gonna write all those out right now. In terms of the type of orbital that you have, in N equals one, all you have is S. So we represent that by using the principal energy level, which is one in this case, and the orbital, which is S. In the main energy level two, we're talking about everything in the second row of the periodic table. In that energy level, we have two types of orbitals. We have the S and the P. We represent those again with the main energy level and then the letter that represents the orbital. So we have two S and two P. Within those, we have a certain number of slots for electrons. So the S can hold a certain number of electrons the P can hold a certain number of electrons. So if you think about it like, let's say you were at the mall. There's different levels, right? And we're talking about an indoor mall, not like an outdoor shopping mall or outlet place. We're talking about a legit mall, okay? Multiple levels, lots of stores, food court. Maybe there's a carousel or something for the kids. Full out mall. You can go to each one of the levels, right? Level one, level two, level three. But that it doesn't stop there. You have different stores and different areas and the mall may be organized to where, okay, we've got all the fragrance stores over here. We've got the food court over there. And that's level one. Level two, you might have a couple of toy stores, some video game stores but it's organized and you can go into specific little neighborhoods or areas. Those are like the orbitals. So the level of the mall that you're in, one, two, or three, that's gonna be your principal energy level, your N. Once you get to that level, there's different stores and kind of different little neighborhoods you can go in. And they can only hold with so many people because there are limits to how many people you can have in a building, not just because of COVID, but because of safety. So fire code tells you the maximum number of occupants in a building. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about how many electrons can fit in an S orbital or a P orbital. And we're getting to that in just a second. But does the concept of the principal energy level and the different orbitals within those energy levels make sense now. Good. I saw a hand. Maybe that was just to say you're good. I know those buttons are real close to each other. But if you have a question and you wanna ask it, you can always jump in. So those are the energy levels. Now, as I said, each energy sublevel can hold a certain number of electrons. Anytime you see an S orbital, it can only hold two electrons. So it doesn't matter if it's the 1s, the 4s, the 7s, it can only hold two electrons. And I have a table in the chapter four lecture on YouTube that has all of this information, but I didn't put that one in to this lecture. I want to have this specific table because it's got a little bit of extra information. 
the p orbital holds six electrons. Again, doesn't matter if it's 2p or 5p, it can only hold six electrons. The two and the five, the six, whatever the principal energy level is, that just tells you how far away those electrons can be. The bigger the principal energy level, the further away the electron can be. The orbital, whether it's an S or a P or a D, that's going to tell you whether or not you can have two electrons total or six total, what have you. Somebody has their mic on, I can hear it. The D orbital can hold 10 electrons. And this is the maximum. It doesn't have to hold 10, it can hold fewer, but it can hold up to 10 electrons. And that's the same thing with the S and the P. What I'm telling you is the maximum. And finally, the F orbital can hold the most electrons. It can hold 14 electrons. Doesn't have to hold all 14 at once, but 14 electrons can live there. Okay, so I have this energy level table along with the different sublevels and how many electrons can live there. So if we had an element that was in the first row, like hydrogen, hydrogen has an atomic number of one. So it has one electron. That one electron lives in the 1s orbital. We would denote how many electrons by putting a superscript after the s. So the one is the energy level, which is just which row it's in on the periodic table. The S is which orbital we're in. And then the number up top tells you the number of electrons that are in that particular orbital. Are you with me so far? Because we're building up to write electron configurations. All right. Now let's say that I had an element with five electrons to place. The 1s can only hold two electrons. So I'm gonna fill that and I'm gonna spill over into the second energy level. So a full 1s is 1s2. I still have another three electrons to place. The next thing I'm going to fill is the 2s. How many electrons can I put into the 2s? I see one answer. How many electrons fit into an S orbital? The answer is already on the slide. I can fit another two. So now we've got two electrons in the first energy level and they're both in the S orbital. I've got another two electrons that I can fit into the 2s orbital. 
How many more electrons do I have to place before I'm done? If we've got five electrons that we need to put somewhere. Cameron, you are on it. We've got one more electron to place. So now we're going to fill the 2P until we're done. We don't have another six electrons. We've only got one. So we're going to put a one there. And the total, if you add up all of the subscripts, should be equal to five, which is the number of electrons that we're trying to place. This is how you build an electron configuration. Now I'm going to give you the order that you fill the electrons in. So we're talking about from 1s all the way up to 7p. It's going to take a minute for me to write this, but here we go. So you can have this. I do this in the video too for chapter four. If it helps you to have this order and then you just kind of memorize it, that's fine. As you practice, you will understand it more and you won't need to rely on it so much. But this is, this is the exact number of how or the exact order of how you fill the orbitals and I'm also going to include how many electrons go in each so this is for the biggest element that you have on the periodic table you fill the 1s the 2s then the 2p now we're in the third row of the periodic table 3s, 3p, then we actually start to fill the 4s, that's actually lower in energy than the 3d. So when you look at the periodic table, the transition elements, those are filling the d orbitals, and you'll notice when you look at the periodic table, the 3D is actually located on the fourth row. It's going to be the same thing when we get around to the 4D, okay? That's going to be in the fifth row, and it fills after the 5S. So remember that. After you fill the 3D, then you're going to fill the 4P. Then you're going to jump to the 5S and fill that. Then you're going to jump back to the 4D and fill that. Once the 4D is filled, you're going to fill the 5P. So it's the same pattern. I'm going to highlight that here. We did the S, then the D, then went back up to the P. Same thing. 5S, 4D, then 5P. Now we're going to fill the 6s, then we're going to finally get to our f orbitals. And in this case, we're filling the 4f. Some periodic tables will have like a gap. Others will just have an asterisk. And that's going to show you, okay, you need to jump down to the bottom of the periodic table where there's those two rows those are filling the f orbitals and we're going to go over the periodic table um, and talk about the different blocks but that's what you're filling you're filling those two rows at the bottom so right now we're filling the top row with the 4f then you go back to the 5d and fill that 
you fill in your 6P. We're almost done. You go to the 7S, fill that. Then you fill your 5F. Your 6D. And finally, your 7P. That is the complete order. So if you have that written down while you're filling out your electron configurations, you can literally go through and fill your electrons until you hit the maximum for each orbital and you will never be steered wrong. Now I was telling you about, you know, we're filling this block and now we're filling that block. Let's look at the periodic table and put this into perspective. So if you have a periodic table with you that's printed out or just one that you can write on, if you have a textbook that is yours, write in it, okay? Each of these blocks we can kind of label. The first block is going to be the S block. Now helium is also a part of that. It just because the S is only two electrons, it's kind of split up for a particular reason. But this is the S block. That means that you're filling the S orbital. So in the first row, you're filling the 1S. The second row in the S block, you're filling the 2S. So on and so forth all the way down the table. So if I asked you, what are we filling? What orbital are we filling? If we're looking at rad radium, you would tell me that we're filling the 7S. Does that make sense so far? We're just defining the periodic table in a way where we can look at it and say, okay, I should be filling this block or this orbital as my final step. Again, this is abstract. So if I lost you, I need to know so I can go back and find you and bring you up to where we are. Are we okay so far? The next block we're gonna talk about is the P block. As you fill the P's next. All the way on the far right, excluding helium, we've got our P block. And that means that as you're going across, you're filling the P orbital. So the last step, let's say, the last bit of your electron configuration for fluorine would have something to do with 2P because it is in row number two and it's in the P block. Now we'll talk about the D block. That's our transition metals. And again, notice how this is the 3D that we're filling, but we're in the fourth row. This is the 4D, 5D, and 6D. So when you're filling the D, the number for the D is always going to be one less than the row that it's in. So if you have molybdenum, it's in the fifth row.
which is called a period. I'm just going to get that out of the way. I believe we would define all that stuff in chapter five, but no harm in telling you now. So molybdenum is in the fifth row or the fifth period. And it is filling the 3, or excuse me, the 4D, not the 3D. The 4D orbital. So that's always the pattern. If you're talking about the D, Whichever row it's in, the D is going to be one less. The last block is the F block. And that typically is at the bottom of the periodic table. And you see where these asterisks are? That's where it fits. Okay. That's our F block, and we're filling, uh -oh. the F orbital. Again, write this on your periodic table. We're going to be doing trends of the periodic table in chapter five. You're going to want to do the same thing. Write the trends in on the periodic table. So by the end of this, you should have a highly decorated periodic table. Now you cannot use that for your exam, but writing it down and using it with your homework assignments will help you. And then when it comes time for the exam, you'll be able to recreate it and then use that to take your exam. So all of these blocks, the S block, D block, P block, F block, label them, know them. It will help you with writing electron configurations. So we're going to take one more step and then I'm going to check in with you. We're going to write the electron configuration for a neutral atom of copper. <laughs> okay. Remember, I'm going to post this PDF too. So if you just want to be lazy and print it out, you can do that as well. But only if you have a color printer. Let me know when I can move on. tell y'all a little bit about my struggles okay before we uh, do this I'll tell you a little bit about my struggles so I had an earpiece die I had another one get weird and my husband had to rig up a studio mic that he had from years ago for me to be able to use to finish the recordings to put up on YouTube and to be able to teach today so one big ups to him much appreciated he ain't here, otherwise his head will swell up. I ain't trying to make his head swell. So that's just between us and YouTube, okay? And right now, I'm talking in front of this mic, and I feel like I'm I'm a DJ on a radio station. Like, you're now tuned in to 102.1. We're listening to today's smooth jazz and yesterday's R&B. <laughs> like, so... It's a little bit of a new setup for me. Um, we're trying to figure out if this is something if that's maintainable or if we should kind of go for something else. So, um, Mr. Hefner, getting a shout out. Big ups to him. Really appreciate him. That's why you have me today. Okay. So, let's get to those electron configurations. We need to write one for copper which is CU. So let's circle that on your periodic table. And you can go along with me. I'm going to be asking you questions along the way. We need to get to 
copper. How many electrons does copper have? Write that in the chat. How many electrons are we going to have to place for copper? We've got 29 electrons to deal with. The reason we know that is because this little 29 up here is the atomic number. And the atomic number tells us the number of protons. Dealing with a neutral atom, the number of protons is going to be equal to the number of electrons. Since we know we have 29 protons, we doggone sure better have 29 electrons or else we are not neutral. Now we have to go through and kind of walk our way across the periodic table. So I'm going to label these energy levels, AKA the rows. So we've got one, two, three, and four within that four, we've got the 3D, and that's where copper is. So we have to walk our way through the periodic table until we get to copper. The first row, all we have is the S, the 1S, and it can fit two electrons. We've got more than that. We've got a total of 29. So that's what we're trying to get up to here. So we've still got another 27 to go. After we fill the 1S, now we're going to jump down to the 2. The first thing we fill is the 2S. And that can hold a maximum of two electrons. So now we've placed a total of four electrons. We've got 25 left. We're still in the two because we don't, we have more than just these two elements here. Now we're over here in the P block. Forgive me, I did not label the blocks. Now we're in the P block. How many electrons can we put in the P orbital? If you don't have it in your notes, it's okay. We can put six there. And I like to keep this running total so that I don't put too many or too few electrons. So now, we are at two plus two plus six. That's 10 electrons. We've got 19 more to go. So we jump down to the third row of the periodic table and walk our way across that. What's the first thing that we're gonna fill in this third row? We're gonna fill the S orbital, specifically the 3S. And we can fit another two electrons in there. We're not done yet, we haven't gotten to copper. So we're gonna hop across to the P block and we're gonna fill that up. So now we've just added another eight electrons. So we are at a total of 18 electrons. We're not done. Copper has 29 electrons. So we're close, 
but not yet. We finally get to jump down to the fourth row or the fourth period, and that is the home of copper. So we're almost there. Again, we're going to fill up the 4S. It can hold two electrons. So now we're at 20 electrons. Now we're filling the 3D, okay? So I labeled that here. We're in the D block, we're filling the 3D. Copper lives in the D block. So our final orbital that we're adding electrons to is going to be the 3D orbital. Now you just count. All right, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now we should have 29 electrons total. So if you go through and add up all of those superscripts, you should get 29 for the total number of electrons. And all we did to write this configuration was walk our way across the periodic table. And once we filled out everything and we still weren't at the element that we needed, we jumped down to the next row and the next row and the next row, filling all of the orbitals along the way until we get to the final orbital, which is where that element calls home. Copper is in the 3D, so that is the final orbital that we are adding electrons to. And notice, there's only nine there. It is not full. There's still room for one more. So how did that feel? Were you able to follow? Do you feel like you could try a problem like this on your own? All right, I'm gonna give you one. <laughs> so, okay. Well, how about this? I'm going to give you one that's not as many. It doesn't have as many electrons. And then I will walk through it. So we'll compromise. Now I want you to write an electron configuration for phosphorus. How many electrons do we need to place for phosphorus? Let's make sure we're all on the same page. We've got 15 electrons. So using your cheat sheet or using the walking along the periodic table method, whichever way, place those 15 electrons. And then I won't have you put it in the chat because it's, it's a little bit hard to do but I will walk it through and then you can check your work. So I will give you five minutes to do this electron configuration and then I'll go through it. I see that we're getting towards the end of class and this is really the last big concept that we have to cover. So we're doing pretty good there. Five minutes and then I'll go over it. If you get stuck and you're like, man, I'm really struggle bus, struggle bus. I've been on here for hours. You can just put help in the chat and that'll let me know how many of you still need um, some work on electron configurations. So go for it. Give it your best shot. So it's been about five minutes. Just by a show of hands, how many of you were able to get to a complete electron configuration? We're not talking about right or wrong, just did you get one? Did anybody else get to the promised land? All 
All right, you can lower your hand. So either we didn't get there or we ain't raise our hand. When you let me know where you are, it helps me give you better feedback and better content. So it's not trying to throw shade at anybody. It's just letting me know how well you're getting it. And I know we're just introducing this and this is one of those really abstract concepts. So you may not have gotten all the way through and that's fine. And that's totally fine that you didn't get it. Let me know. So we're gonna walk it through together. We've gotta place 15 electrons. Okay, yeah, I wanna mention so in the chapter four folder, there is a video that I found on YouTube that gives kind of a visual of how to do electron configurations, the full one, and then what's called the condensed or noble gas configuration. Don't worry about that one yet. You will have to do it. That comes up in chapter five, but it's about a seven or seven and a half minute video. And it's a great video. I could redo it but that would take a lot of time. Someone else already did it and she did a great job. So I posted a link to that as well. So in that chapter four folder, you'll see the link for the chapter four lecture, the annotated notes. You'll also see a link to that video. So it's a video for electron configurations. Watch that if you're still a little bit confused because it was really, really helpful. I am not too proud to admit when someone has a great idea and the way she did it was a great idea. So please, if you're stuck, even if you're not stuck and you just want to make sure you get it, watch that video. It's like seven and a half minutes long. Okay. So let's walk across the periodic table. We're going to start with the S block, of course, at row one. The only thing that we have here is the S. Now we're gonna fill it up because we've got 15 electrons to place. That one S can only hold two electrons. Now we're gonna jump down to the second row of the periodic table. The first thing we're gonna fill is again that 2s because we're in the s block then we keep walking across and we end up in the p block in the 2p we can fit another six electrons so let's stop and do a tally real quick we've placed four two plus two plus six electrons, that's 10 electrons. We said phosphorus, a neutral atom, has 15 electrons, so we're not there yet. We did use helium. Helium is a part of the S block, but it's also a noble gas. A noble gas, which we haven't talked about these yet, this will be in chapter five, a noble gas has all of the available slots in the orbitals for that energy level completely full. So helium has the electron configuration of 1s2. It's a noble gas, but it is not a part of the P block. What I just boxed in red is 1s, okay? So it's a little bit confusing, but once you understand more about the trends of the periodic table, it makes more sense. So we jump down to the third row. We're back to the S block. We're gonna fill the S block because we still haven't reached phosphorus. So that's another two electrons added on for a total of 12. We're getting close. 
Now we're in the P block in row three. How many electrons should I place here to complete our configuration? Cameron's getting the gold star today. We have three more to place. And that gives us a total of 15 electrons. So if you were to add up all of these little subscript or superscripts, just like I was doing down at the bottom, you should get a total of 15. And we're literally walking across the periodic table and saying, okay, this is 1s2. Here we're at 2s2. If I get here, then it's 2p6. 3s2. 3p6. 4s2. 3d10, 4p6. So those are kind of some anchors that you can put on your periodic table so that you can walk across and know where you are. This takes practice. So if it doesn't make 100% sense now, that's okay. How many of you feel a little bit better than when I first let you loose on the problem? Show of hands or say me. Do you feel a little bit more confident about it? May not be totally there yet. Okay. All right, that's the right direction. That is definitely the right direction. Practice. You have to do one of these for your chapter check-in. It is part of the Mastering Chemistry homework. I will put some additional practice problems into the Chapter 4 folder along with an answer key. Those problems, don't turn them in anywhere because I ain't grading them. But if you need some more practice and you want to check your answers, that's a great way to do it. I also had an example of doing something that's all the way down here in the F block. I'm going to walk that through real quick and then we'll move on. So I want to get to something that's a little bit, you know, further down on the periodic table. So just walk with me for a minute. Remember, this is our S block. D block, P block, and F block. There's a song that's in my head, and I don't know if y'all know this song. It was like my block. Like that always runs through my head, and I can't think of the artist. But it's like going through my head right now. Like I can see the music video in my head of that song. And it just, it drives me crazy. Because I can't just pull it up or start playing it. One, it's probably not appropriate. But two, YouTube would come for me. So I'm not trying to have that. But if you're curious, you can YouTube it yourself. Figure it out. But that's what runs through my head when we're talking about these different blocks. All right. So we've got all of our principal energy levels. And then we've got, we're going to label our D's and our F's. So feel free to do that on your own periodic table. So is everybody still with me? All I did was a little bit of labeling.
Now we're going to start walking it through. Always start with the one S. We, we have a lot to go. We've got 60 electrons. So we're going to be doing this for a while. Okay. So we've done the one S. Now we're going to do row two. We start with the S block. Then we move on to the P's. And we can fit six there. Checking them off along the way. If that helps you do it, go run through a lot of periodic tables, but that's okay. Jesus will make more trees. Now we're in the third row and we're going to do, we're going to do three S. And fill that the S orbital can only handle two. And if you need to write that on your periodic table, two electrons max, 10 electrons max, six for the P block and 14 for the F block, that's fine too. Take your periodic table, write all over it. The more you write this, the more ingrained it will be in your head. After we walk through the 3S, we ain't there yet, okay? So now we have to go through all of the P's. The 3P orbital can hold six electrons. Now we're in the fourth row, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. We're going to fill that 4S with two electrons. Then we're going to fill the 3D with 10 electrons. Okay, so we did all that. Then we're back to having the 4 as the principal energy level in the P block. So make sure that you understand that transition. Transition metals, you're going to have, you're going to be in the 3D. And then once you start filling the P, you're back to the 4. We're going to fill that up with 6 electrons. Now we're in row 5. It's going to look very similar to the row we just did. We're going to fill the 5S. Now, what do we fill next? We filled our 5S. What comes after that? We're going to fill that 4D and that has 10 available spots. Now we're back at the fives again and we're going to fill the 5P. So remember the pattern that we just did for the row above it was we did the S, then the D, then the P. In row five it's the same thing, the S, the D, then the P. We're still not there yet. Now we're in row six. We're getting close. We're going to fill the S orbital. This asterisk tells us to go down to this first row here. We're in the F block now. We're filling the 4F here. How many electrons do I need to put in the 4F to complete this configuration?
you can literally count one, two, three, four. That is the full configuration for neodymium. Very long. I want you to be able to walk through and do one like this. So I didn't do these examples in the chapter four lecture video. I left them blank. So you can redo it and check your answer using the um, live lecture notes. Then you can quiz yourself on the chapter check-in. I have you do europium. So you're going to write an electron configuration for europium. It is very similar to the one we just did. So at the very least, you should have it right up to this point. How many of us feel a little bit better than we did previously with electron configurations? Let me know if you feel a little bit better. Let me know if you feel worse. Say, nah, still feel the same. That's okay. And if you don't want to share, that's okay too. But I like it when you share. So electron configurations, it's probably the hardest part of the chapter. Okay, still feeling the same. That's all right. It's probably the first time you're really doing this. And if it isn't the first time, it may be the first time in a while. So it's going to take some time and some practice. But do practice. Like I said, I'm going to post some chapter four practice problems and the answer key. I know, Cameron, it's okay. But you were on it. You were on it today. So I have some other practice problems that I'm not going to have you do, but you can do this as practice and I will post the answers. I will write in the answers after the lecture and post the PDF with the answers for these two questions. So you can do this on your own time as practice. As always, I'm going to finish up with reminders. So there were some problems with respondents. Um, the university license saying that we don't have enough spots for everybody. So I contacted IT on Friday. I know other instructors did as well. I have not heard back from them yet. I haven't had a chance to check my email, but I'm sure they're working on it because that's kind of a big problem. So if you have not taken exam one yet, it's okay. Once the problem is fixed, I will give you another two days to take exam one. I will send out an announcement through Blackboard and let you know Respondus is fixed and you have until this date and this time to finish the exam. If you've already done it, thank you. I'm not grading them yet and I'm not releasing the grades until everyone has taken it and the period for taking the exam has closed. So I apologize, I'm sure you're like, man, I wanna know what I got, but I wait until everyone has taken the exam or at least everyone who's going to take it has taken it. So that's the update with that. Chapter four, you have a check-in to do. You also have mastering chemistry homework and a quiz. All of those things are due on Sunday, September 20th, before midnight. So 11.59 p.m., have your PDF uploaded to Blackboard for your chapter check-in and have your Mastering Chemistry homework done by that time. The Mastering Chemistry, that's a hard deadline. So if you don't have it done, you can still do it, but it's not going to be for credit. With the chapter check-in, I give you an additional week to hand it in for partial credit. So each day that it's late, you're going to lose 7% of the total value. On that seventh day, it's worth about half the number of points that it normally would be. This one is worth 20 points. 
let's say you turn it in on September 27th, a week later, it's going to be worth 10 points. Still better than zero points, though. So you have that one week of grace to turn it in for some credit. The advantage of the chapter check-in is that you get feedback from me. And I can tell you specifically, oh, you did this wrong. This was good up to this step, but now you should have filled this orbital instead of that orbital. So please take the time to do the chapter check-in. Your next exam is going to cover chapters three and four. I will post an exam review, make sure there's plenty of problems and answer keys so that you can get all the practice you need. It's again going to be through Respondus, and that will be available Wednesday the 23rd through Friday the 25th, assuming that everything has been worked out with Respondus. So don't forget, we are still moving along in the class. Next week, we're going to be covering Chapter 5, but you'll also have an exam. This class moves really quickly. So please, 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 if you are behind, talk to me. Don't just stay in the shadows. Send me a message. From now on, we have to use course messages. I've been a little bit lax with that because I know that we're still getting used to it. But the university is being firm about using Blackboard and the course messages to correspond about coursework and courses in general. And that's because all of our correspondence is kept right there and it's isolated for each class. So it makes it easier for me to know what class you're emailing me about. And I can give you a quicker answer versus saying, um, who are you again? Because I have like a hundred some odd students and I can't remember which section you're in. Or you're in Chem 103, but are you Monday morning or are you Tuesday afternoon? So use course messages. It's in there under communication and you can send me a message through there. I check it just like I check my email. So if you send me an email, my response is going to be, hey, gotcha, but you got to send this through course messages. And I'm not going to give you an answer until you send it to me through course messages. Not trying to be rude, but I ain't getting in trouble for y'all. So send me your messages through course messages in Blackboard. If you have any other questions, let me know. Otherwise, you are free to go. We are done with chapter four.